We'll turn it over to Carrie to introduce our program today. Thank you, sir. Okay, today um, Shelly and Chris Johnson are here to talk about their recent trip to Nicaragua to build a home for the Fuller Center for Housing. It's the home that uh, our Perry Rotary Club helped make possible. Shelly's a real estate paraprofessional with Walker, Hol Walker Holbrook, Gray, and Moore in Perry. And she's volunteered at several Fuller Center events. And she's recently joined the, the Perry, Georgia Fuller Center for Housing as a board member. Chris is a longtime newspaper journalist, and he's uh, now a director for communications for the Fuller Center for Fuller Center International. And he's also a uh, Perry Fuller Center board member. He writes a weekly column that appears in the Columbus Ledger Inquirer. Please welcome Shelley and Chris Johnson. I'm glad he mentioned that I, I still write a column for the Ledger Inquirer because this is, but he's still, and I didn't know if that was like a bad present tense and the police chief's here. I, I don't steal. <laughs> I want to make sure of that. Um, before I let Shelley kind of do the what we did on our fall vacation tour here, uh, I was back here in, I guess, about April or so last spring and told you that we were starting a Perry Fuller Center, a Perry affiliate of the International Fuller Center where I work. And we kind of had the ambitious goal of doing 20 projects last year of, of repairing homes. Uh, we failed, we only did 19. So I hope that you help us spread the word because we want to at least double that in the year to come, maybe more. Um, we've got a lot of things going on this year. We've got a team of college students, about 10 or 12, who will be here in March, who are going to spend a whole week. And they're from uh, Wittenberg College in Springfield, Ohio. And they'll spend a week here, we're going to host them and they're going to repair three homes, put roofs on three homes. So we hope to do more of that kind of stuff in the future. And we'll, we hope you help spread the word about what we're doing. And, and as a reminder, we, we don't have any kind of paid staff uh, here at Perry, no offices. Our offices are, are dining room tables and a couple of desks. So. Um, again, it was the, we were, at the time I spoke to you, I didn't know I was going to be heading back to Nicaragua again the week after Thanksgiving. But I found out we were going to celebrate 10 years of the Fuller Center by building 10 homes in one week. And we did that. And Shelly decided that she didn't want me to go to such luxurious locations as Las Benitas all by myself, Gallivant. So she decided she wanted to spend a week of her vacation actually building. And I can tell you, it's hard work down there. So, and these are hard-working local folks, but they need um, the help of people like Shelley and the, I guess, about 40 or 50 other volunteers we had there. <coughs> so I'll, I'll turn it over to Shelley, and, and if she, she has a tendency to get emotional every now and then about the, the plight of some of these hard work folks. So she, she chokes up or anything, I'll translate it into English. <laughs> <laughs> My main problem is I get too wordy. I get really excited about the slides, and I'll have to keep it short. So if I get too far along, somebody go like this, and I'll move quickly. Um, the main thing we were doing down there, and I want to say thank you for the donation that the uh, Rotary Club made for our trip. It made a big difference, all the donations did, that everybody got so that we could all go and do something really important for these people. Um, this is a typical house in Nicaragua and Las Panitas. Um, very uh, standard, uh, looks like just wood that they took out of a tree and then pieces of tin and all that that they just slap up and that's it. There's no water, there's no electricity, there's no indoor plumbing. Some of them have some electricity that they'll rickety kind of tap on somewhere and run it to their house. This is another good example of a typical home that has plastic walls. They don't really have solid walls, a lot of them. Very, very uh, simple and barely keep out anything really. Uh, these people's home had fallen and they were literally living in this bed frame and what little bit they had they kept on it in this dresser that they were able to procure but this nanny is uh, what they drape over them at night to keep the mosquitoes on the bottom. And they live there. This is a typical sink that most all the residents have and uh, that's their kitchen. It's outside and this one was near somebody's, but it wasn't being used currently. But this is the side where they would literally hand wash their clothes each day. Um, in the center, they would pull the water to do washing with. And on the far end, they would pull water that they would get to drink out of. And that was about all they had access to. 
to. And that's outside of each of their homes. And that's an example of their power grid. <laughs> um, they literally tap on and run power to their houses from that all along. And you'll see that whenever you're there across a road and it, it kind of droops. And whenever a vehicle comes through, if you know, a tractor or a big truck, they have to get out and find a stick and lift the power up so they can go under it and then drop the cord back. I mean, that's very It's, it's an OSHA nightmare is what it yeah, is. Yeah, there's a lot of safety <laughs> issues there. Um, the children all work and help with all the daily functions of the home. They just, uh, when they get a little older than this, they do attend the schools nearby that they walk to, but here they're all helping us gather the rocks that are gonna be the base in their home. These were two of the kids from the house that we built. Um, this is the oldest daughter in the house that we built, and she was watching me put mortar on the ends and thought she could help me with it in a better way, be a little more efficient. So she jumped in, and we had quite a good time trying to do that. Well, that was a little embarrassing because she actually showed us a better way to do it. Yeah, she didn't, she didn't think I was doing it right, so she came <laughs> over and wanted to help. So that was really fun. They all work with us. These are all, these are other home owners and this was what they had as their home previously and we're hand sifting everything you do there is by hand you mix mortar by hand and uh, sift through the sand and take shovels and literally mix everything by hand here and all the kids are very active in helping and wanting to, to do right along with you um, this is kind of an example of where this this neighborhood sits this little village it's carved out of a huge jungle uh, just inland from the sh from the shoreline and uh, here we're on a roof we do use rebar down in the blocks to help make them more secure because there's a lot of active volcanoes around and earthquakes are a possibility so these houses not only have to be uh, kind of a shelter from the rain and the wind but also be pretty strong so here we're laying mortar down in the holes and around in the block an example of that this is the inside of the home that you guys helped pay for. Almost finished it though. Almost finished. It's got a tin <laughs> roof. Um, and this is pressure treated wood. Um, some of the houses, of course, they had just any old wood they could find. And at night, the termites would eat on that and they would wake up covered in, you know, dust, dust from the termites all over them. So it's a big deal to have this pressure treated wood and a tin roof and the block. And then this is a uh, the rough cement flooring before we put a smooth layer down and the kids of course were helping us sweep all that up and this is kind of an example of their homemade wheelbarrows and the piles of the dirt and the rocks that were mixing together to put the houses. And this is one of those uh, uh, I told her to take a picture of me working because I'm always behind the camera so I have to get busy. <laughs> <laughs> he got a little dirty too. He did. He did. The home that we built for they had pet rabbits. Um, they have a lot of dogs and cats that roam around, but they're not pets. They uh, don't love on them or feed them. They're the saddest dogs you've ever seen in your life. But for whatever reason, they do have good, ha fat, happy pigs because they eat them as soon as they get big enough. And some of the families have rabbits for pets. I just thought they were sweet. These are the children that are living in the home that you guys helped build. Um, all very sweet. There's one not pictured there. I called him the Buddha baby. He was a, about a year and a half and he was really heavy and Yeah, the, the, the little starving child images you see, that's not him. No, no, <laughs> he was very happy. But, and on our break times, the kids, you know, I don't speak Spanish and I, I strive to do that. I want to do that. But um, they would take the time to, in between when we were building, to try to almost a charades to make out words and phrases and we communicate and they love to play games, little hand games and things like that in between all of our breaks. No video games, it's kind of nice actually. No video games. No, they're very hand -like stuff. These are some of the neighbor kids. As you'll see, they're just all so sweet. I can't, I can't tell you how sweet the children are. Happy, just always smiling, always helping, always wanting to play. Those are the neighbor's kids. And this is little Ezekiel I wanted to bring home with me, and Chris wouldn't let me. <laughs> I put him in my suitcase and stick him home. He, uh, he insisted on being around every time. We had 10 different homes going while we were there, all of us as a group, and everybody was assigned houses. And 
you know, they're all building it along the street, and Ezekiel would, you know, go up and down the street and see everybody, play with everybody, help when he could. It was funny. All the kids were very active like that. He was tired. That well, was yeah, he was a little tired. <laughs> they're very active. They were very happy. That's the house that uh, our family used to live in. Of course, they leave this house next to the one that we built, which is over here to the right of that, not in the picture. But they keep that as a structure to uh, keep other things in because they kind of, they're not going to tear that down and do away with it, in other words. They'll keep some things in there and then the nicer home that's more secure, they will sleep in it mostly and put things like that. And of course, like I say, the kids wanted to play and there's that little poor puppy there everywhere and just sad. If you notice the ground and the rock, this is this is a street down yeah. there. That's that's playing in the street and the little nerf balls were thrown back forth. We went by the Dollar Tree and picked we up. We weren't supposed to really bags. take gifts, but I snuck. We figured a dollar <laughs> nerf football would not really count as a gift. So we got a bunch of those and the kids love that kind of stuff. Yeah, down there. jump ropes, things like that. Cars. And the little Ezekiel had a little car and I bet we sat there 30, 40 minutes playing. He wouldn't let me get up. He just wanted to go back and forth with that little car forever. It was funny to me all the simple things that made them so happy. They were just all so pleased with any little thing. Uh, this is the oldest daughter, Dahlia and Ariana, the little girl, and she's writing me a note here. And again, communication was tough because I didn't speak Spanish. So she's writing it in Spanish and trying to draw things of what she's trying to tell me. And um, each of us had an interpreter with us uh, most of the day that would come and go. And so I went down our interpreter to tell me what she was writing. And she told me that she uh, wished she had the courage to ask for a small computer because her family was too poor to own one. And at her school, it would help her if she could use that. Of course, that broke my heart. And we had to immediately figure out how we were going to get a computer down there to Dahlia <laughs> for Christmas. And we, we did, however, sneak that down there on the next trip that went, just a small one. We thought that was uh, important to get to her, and that was our Christmas gift to each other, was a computer for her. It made us very happy. It was a, a big deal for her, I'm sure. We got photos of that after she got it. This is the finished product of the house that we built, and this little fella, he was one of the young Masons. Um, they all learned how to do things in the neighborhood, and he works very, he worked very hard all day, every day, and here it looks like he hasn't done a thing, but we, he, that was probably the first time yeah. I saw him sit still the whole week. He was a uh, very hard worker. Yeah, one, of the, of one of the things we do when we go on these trips is, or, or any of our international locations, people will criticize you and say, you shouldn't go down there and take these jobs from these people. Well, we're volunteering we're down there, but we're, we're creating these jobs. These masons get paid to finish these homes. Wow. And without without our being down there, and our our volunteers don't work, don't accomplish nearly as much as these folks do. So I mean, it's yeah. it's more of a. They were on this site, which was a mile from our hotel. We walked to there every day, about a mile. They would be on the site as soon as the sun was up, and there at least an hour or two before we got there. They did not take a lunch break when we went in town to go have our lunch. And then whenever we left in the evenings, they were still there as long as the sun was up working well beyond when we were there volunteering work. Without so them, this house would not have gotten built. Right, right. Chris and I were put in charge of this house, and I've done some of the tin uh, on a house here in Perry, so I was a little familiar with how to do that, but as far as the brickwork and the block, I had not done that before, so we had to have them there to tell us what to do and to help us with all that. It would have been in a big mess, but it turned out great. And that's a typical window. They have, like, glass shelves and louvers and they can shut them and open them and that was a big deal to them. They had no window in their other house and nice solid door that they could lock, keep their belongings inside front and back and again that was a huge deal because they didn't have that. And this was a thank you sign we made to kind of thank everybody that helped donate for my trip because without that I wouldn't have been able to go. And that's a picture of the whole team, all of us that were down there. And then this is a close-up of the mother and the children, except for little Buddha, uh, Joseph. And that's in front of the house. Um, the, an interesting point here is that you, the mom here, Elizabeth, the house and the land is deeded in the mother's names, and that's so that the children always have somewhere to live because oftentimes their family unit's not like it is here. Um, the dads can come and go, so to speak. 
So um, they make sure that the children have a home and everything is deeded and given and the keys are given to the mothers. And that's little Ezekiel and holding the sign for me. He sat down with me and insisted on reading that sign in English about three times in a row and he wouldn't let Chris take his picture. And all, otherwise all the kids want their pictures taken. But he said, no photo. And he wanted to read and sound out every single name on the sign, frontwards and backwards. It was the sweetest thing. So anyway, he was very thankful to you guys and others who donated. And this was a, a kind of a almost finished house that we did for this guy. He, was, uh, he worked in town near the hotel that we stayed at. And he was getting that house for his mother. So his mother would have somewhere. He was very emotional and thankful. This is not Momotombo, no, but this is a volcano you can see from the back of the village that had erupted about three weeks before we got there. And so it's, it's usually always smoking, too. Yeah, so down at the end of the street we were building on, you could see in the distance an active volcano. That was interesting, very interesting. This is the hotel we stayed in, which according to their terms was very luxurious, by the way. Very, very luxurious. The power worked some of the time. And um, the water worked some of the time. You had water, but no hot water. Uh, at best, it was lukewarm. They warm all the water in a big barrel on top of the roofs, and that's the only water they have that's sun warm. And this is where all our volunteer teams stay when they go down here. And what's interesting about, about this hotel is the owner of it is a member of the Rotary Club in Lyon, Nicaragua. I think we hooked Mike up with it and they had some conversations. Yeah, so that's the side, and that's the inside of the hotel. Don't mind me, I was tired. <laughs> but um, Day one. that's considered a very, very, very nice hotel. And uh, the bathroom and all, it was, it was, it was uh, by our standards not good, but for there, you were, I don't know, it just made you recognize compared to where you went during the day and what they had, how very nice that was for there. And that's the back of the hotel, and what's so funny, bad. yeah, it's beautiful, and it's on the beach. And uh, you look out and the ocean and all is just beautiful and your location is beautiful and then you go turn the other direction and it's just poverty. That's what it looks like right, right behind the hotel. Yeah, so okay. I mean, it, was, it was very dr drastic the difference between how beautiful a location it was and yet how poor those people were. It was a fishing village and that's a, the water warming in the barrels on top there. Whatever that, whatever was warm was gone. That was that. <laughs> There's no hot water, but it, no it's, hot. it's 90 something degrees every day. So it's, yeah. that it good. was, it's kind of like the surface of the sun, hot. It was very, very <laughs> hot. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, Mombo Tumbo, the volcano that erupted while we were there for the first time in 105 years. And this is on our way in that on day one we stopped and I, we got my picture in front of it. And little did I know, two days later it would decide to erupt. There it is. Mm -hmm. so we had tsunami warnings and earthquake watches. watches and tsunami watches while we were there and we had to learn the evacuation routes and where to go to high ground. So it was very exciting but um, I have to admit nothing happened at all. So. <laughs> and our driver who carried us back to Managua the last night took this photo mm -hmm. one night. And, and this, is the, the, this is the first time this volcano had erupted in 105 years. And it happened while, while, while we were there. there. So it was kind of exciting. And that lava flow was pretty significant for a first day or two. And then it slacked off and it was getting much more quiet. I think that might be. Yep, and that's it. So anyway, uh, we do great work down there and in many other places. And internationally, Fuller Center does. And um, anyway, I hope to go back to Nicaragua one day and visit that family because it was uh, very enlightening to be with those sweet people and how thankful they were. And I hope to go back one day. And I want to go other places. Um, I know we, they do work in Haiti, which I'm aspiring to go to next, but we'll see. But anyway, thank you all very much for your donation. It meant a lot. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for our speakers? Yeah. What sort of jobs do the family, the mother and father have? All, almost everybody down there is a fisherman first. Mm -hmm. uh, they all have some other job, but everybody's a fisherman when they clean fish. and it, It's somewhat of a job. They sell it, but they also eat a lot of what they catch. 
Um, a lot of them are, are the maids um, at some of the little local hotels. And like I said, that was a luxurious one. The other ones are not nearly that nice. Um, and there's actually a, there's a surf school down there. Uh, and there's a lot of little restaurants. And by restaurant, I mean tin shack with two tables in it. And there's probably 40 of them down the street, but nothing huge. So you have a lot of cooks and, and that kind of thing down there. And of course, we have these masons that, that work on our homes and stuff. So there's a lot of construction jobs down there now. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? How do you go about selecting that area, that town, to for, for you? Well, it's actually it's actually the way the Fuller Center works because <coughs> we actually you know we didn't pick Perry and we didn't pick this place, Nickra. We wait for people to come to us, and we only go where people invite us to work. So we'll, anytime I post something on Facebook, like uh, we did something in Nicaragua, there'll always be somebody saying, well, you need to work in America. I'm like, well, we do that too. Yeah. Well, I love how people jump to the absolute worst conclusion first before they know what they're talking about. But any place people ask us to go, we'll kind of bet them to make sure you know, it's a legitimate operation. The folks who run Las Benitas um, were Habitat affiliates uh, until Habitat pulled out. Um, and we, we adopted a good many Habitat affiliates over the last two years um, as their fees have gone up and that kind of thing. But uh, so they already knew what they were doing, so it was kind of an easy choice. Uh, they had actually contacted us for about seven years, and we, at the time we just didn't feel like we could expand. So we finally relented and went down there, and it has taken off like gangbusters down there. We've already built about 50 in this one tiny little community, and we've got a group called New Story Charity that's going to help us probably build about 100 more. What's your average cost to build a home down here? Down in Nicaragua, it usually runs about 4500 to 5000 um, And that, that's pretty typical. Almost anywhere we work, um, we're doing the same thing in Nepal, you know, where we've, uh, you know, we've built a little community near about 30 miles from where the earthquake hit. And the houses we built there were completely unscathed while everything around them fell down. So we're building 200 new homes there. And we're training all the Masons in that whole region of Nepal to go build in their communities. You know, we don't care who gets the credit. You know, it's amazing how much you can get done. We don't care who gets the credit. We just want them to do a better job um, with their building techniques. But I don't think we, we, we built an international home more than $7,500 anywhere. Are the materials available locally or? In, in most places. Um, they, they have to go into Lyon, which is about, about 30 minutes, 35 minutes away from Las Benitas. It's a pretty big city. It was the original capital in Nicaragua. Um, but it's a, they get the, the cement mix, you know, concrete blocks, things like that delivered into there. Now, how they delivered, I don't know, because there's not a road sign on anything in Nicaragua. I don't <laughs> no believe. addresses, yeah. And some days you had to adjust what work you did. Like if we went there one day, it's like, we're going to do the roof. We got there, there was no tin. So it was like, well, we'll do more cement and more floor, or, you know, and we'll put up more block, and or we'll put in a window, or we'll go down here and help them do their doors, and I mean, just whatever was available that day. Yeah, there's no do. loads. It's not. It's not quite yeah, that efficient. Yeah, it's funny. They, they, they don't exactly. It's not like we have FedEx and UPS that delivers when you know something's coming. Down there, it was funny. You would just wait for the truck to come by with whatever supplies they were bringing, and it didn't always come as planned. So you had to be ready to adjust and, and help with other homes that had things that they could work with while you were waiting on something. It was interesting. That was very eye-opening too. Because like here, when you when you build a house, I mean, you just go get everything you need in the order you need it, right when you need it. There, mm-mm. <laughs> you kind of do what you can when you get it. Who coordinates all the delivery? I mean, who? The local uh, Las Panitas and Leon Fuller Center affiliate who runs the build, they, we kind of have to partner with them to find all the connections to get those things to us. When they know we're going to be there, they have to start setting that up in advance to be sure we have something to do. <laughs> yeah, wherever the Fuller Center works, even in, in the United States, we rely on the local covenant partners to right. organize everything. So almost every <coughs> construction manager, we have a construction manager down there and a, a president down there, and, and they, are, they have a pretty well-oiled machine in, mm -hmm. for Nicaragua. Where, I didn't see any restroom facilities or anything. Oh, yeah. Any, I, can, I can show you one. <laughs> they don't really have indoor restrooms at all. Um, That's one. Yeah, they'll, they'll have like a little plastic square building, so to speak, somewhere right outside of their little houses. I thought there was a there, there's put a bathroom in the house or something? No, there's no. not any in there. They, Mainly because we don't have the, the water. That's one behind us. That's one. 
This yeah. is their bathroom for our family, by the way. It was plastic walls. It had a little bit of a piece of wood to block the front with a little latch to go in. And basically inside of there is literally a hole in the ground with a cement formed hole built in above it. And then that was, that's it. And so it's 95 it, degrees. Yeah, so it's very, very, very hot. Or, and if it's mm -hmm. wet in the wet season, I mean, obviously you're in your little house and you have to go to the bathroom. You're going out there to that, you know, in the middle of the night or in the day. But they were very nice and offered to let us use it, and we decided. Yeah, they said, you know, they did. wanted to show us their venue, <laughs> so we knew where it was. And I was like, that's okay. I, yeah, I'll be all right during the day. I think I'll make it. I did not go in there, but <laughs> I saw them open the door, go in and out from time to time, and and yeah, that that was awful. Uh, that's all they have, though. So to them, they know no different. They just know no different, and for some reason that reached a full point, they literally just shift it, boom, do another one. That's it. Yeah. How about the water supply? Sure. Well, our water? family had, you know, that sink that we saw. There was one outside of their shack, and right beside it was a little spigot coming up out of the ground and a little plastic hose that was, you know, eight, ten foot. That hose would reach around to the little, the big sink they had, and it would slowly run water into one of those compartments and fill throughout the day. I, I guess well, they tapped into something underground. This is an estuary back here. Right. It's mud right there. Well, at high tide, it fills up. Right. And they will get their water from the sea and stuff like that. And they'll just it, tap down into it. And this it's scary, brown though. water it's scary just drips water. out of this hose until it collects enough to be used for stuff. And they'll drink that. They'll bathe with that. They'll cook for that. Their cooking is all outside. Their bathing's all outside. They stood behind, well, you can't see it there, but their little house. One day I went back there, I was looking for the kids, and the, I guess it was her brother was there. He's literally out back with a bucket of water and a cup, and he's soaping up, <coughs> just standing there and pouring it over his hand. I mean, that's, that's all they have. That was, that was it. And if you've ever smelled low tide at the Georgia coast or anything like that, that's what it smells like there. Mm -hmm. Only with more trash and stuff because they have terrible sanitation. Yeah, there. there's that was something that was hard for me to get over too. There's, they would, you know, if they had a wrapper or any trash, it just, boop, wherever they were, it just went to the ground. And everywhere you went, there was just trash everywhere. They don't have any kind of trash collection whatsoever. And some of the people that they've built homes for in the past, I think they started to pick up in those areas because you could clearly tell the previous homes from other builds when they had been there. Their area was bob wired off to kind of signify this is mine. And in that area, some of them were very, very clean and there was no trash in that area and it was all picked up and I was like, wow. And Chris said, yeah, I said, I think we're starting to impose upon them, you know, don't throw that on the ground because whenever we were, you know, all of us were there, we'd be picking it up. and. So I think some of them are starting to learn to do that for themselves, but there's no formal trash pickup or any understanding of that whatsoever. Yeah, they don't, they don't know what that's about. <laughs> very normal for them. Well, thank y'all very much. We'll give them another thank round.